Folks are still joining us, but I think I'll get us started. Good afternoon and welcome to this session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon, we will focus on a new book by Beth Bailey, An Army of Fire, How the U.S. Army Confronted Its Racial Crisis in the Vietnam Era. Congratulations, Beth, and welcome to the Washington History Seminar. We're also very fortunate to have with us Greg Redatis, who will provide initial comments and launch our discussion. A warm welcome to you as well, Gregory. I'm Christian Osterman. I direct the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program, and I have the privilege to co-chair the seminar series with Eric Arneson of the National History Center and George Washington University. Today, Eric will introduce our speakers and moderate the discussion. The Washington History Seminar, as those who tune in regularly know, is a collaborative effort of our two organizations, the National History Center of the American Historical, Histo American Historical Association and the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program. Over the past decade, the seminar has served as a nonpartisan forum to discuss important new historical publications, and we'll do so today. Behind the scenes, there are two individuals who have produced this event, Rachel Wheatley for the American Historical Association and Peter Bierstecker for the Wilson Center. Our thanks to both of them. We'd like to acknowledge our supporters and we welcome your support. Details about how to support the seminar are available in the chat right now or simply go to our institutional websites. Finally, join us next Monday, November 6th, for discussion of the struggle for Iran, oil, autocracy, and the Cold War, 1951 to 1954. Just a quick technical note on the um, on the proceedings here. Um, today's session will be recorded and will soon appear on our respective organizations' websites and YouTube feed. Um, for the Q&A part of the session, there are two ways you can join the conversation. One is to use the raise hand function and the Zoom functionality. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, once you press the button, you will be entered into a queue. When the moderator, in today's case Eric, calls on you, you will receive a prompt that will ask you to unmute your screen. Please press yes, and otherwise we won't be able to hear you. This is our preferred way for you to, to join us, but you can also do so by uh, using the Q&A, uh, uh, posting a comment or question in the Q&A function of Zoom. And with that, I'll turn it over to Eric. Eric, all yours. Thank you, Christian. I am delighted to introduce our author this afternoon, Beth Bailey, who is Foundation Distinguished Professor of History and Director of the Center for Military, War, and Society Studies at the University of Kansas. She has authored or edited 12 books, including From Front Porch to Back Seat, Courtship in the 20th Century, published in 1989 with Johns Hopkins University Press, Sex in the Heartland, Harvard University Press, 1999, and America's Army, Making the All-Volunteer Force, also Harvard, 2009. She chairs the Department of the Army Historical Advisory Subcommittee, and her honors include a Carnegie Fellowship and the Society for Military History's Samuel Elliott Morrison Prize for Lifetime Achievement, among other things. She is today speaking about her new book, An Army of Fire, How the U.S. Army Confronted Its Racial Crisis in the Vietnam Era, published last May by the University of North Carolina Press. Beth, welcome to the seminar. We're delighted you're here. Thanks so much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Are you going to introduce Greg or do you want me to start talking? You go first. I'll introduce okay. Greg when we get to him. All right. Great. Thanks. Um, so um, just let me start with thanks uh, to you, Eric, and also to Christian, to the AHA, and um, to the Wilson Center. I had a fellowship at the Wilson Center uh, when I was working on America's Army, and it absolutely changed the approach I took to the book. So I'm, I remain incredibly grateful there. Um, and to, to Greg Dattis, who um, will offer what are his usual insightful comments and questions, I have no doubt. Um, and also thanks to anybody who's here. I uh, can't see you, but I am looking forward to your questions. Okay, so what's the book about? Um, it's one of those books with the subtitle that pretty much sums it all up, how the army confronted its racial crisis in the Vietnam era. Um, even so, I'm often 
surprised by how many people think I must actually really have wanted to write a history of the struggles of black soldiers, um, despite how clearly the subtitle makes clear that that's not what I'm up to. Um, but the longer version of the book, what it's about, uh, by the early 1970s, army leaders had begun to worry that racial conflict within the ranks, I mean, specifically black-white racial conflict, was threatened to undermine the U.S. Army's ability to defend the nation, its ability to fight and win the nation's wars. Um, and as Army leaders tried to figure out how to solve what they came to call the problem of race, by which they meant the widespread conflict and racial violence that was going on, that they tried a whole variety of ways. And some of those, I found, were just surprisingly creative. Um, ways that even challenged fundamental army principles of discipline, of order, hierarchy, authority. Um, in the end, what I'm arguing is that they took progressive actions in the interest of conservative goals. They acted in the interest of preserving the army, but their actions fostered racial justice and equality. That's sort of the, the short, no detail version. Where did this come from? Um, when I was writing America's Army, which was about the making of the all volunteer force, I kept coming across stories and reports and analysis and policy that was about racial conflict and army concerns about race. And so in some ways, it's not surprising that I want to follow that up. It was just everywhere. And, you know, given given the historiography, given the questions the nation asked today, uh, it seemed important to me. But there's something else that's also at stake here. Um, Going all the way back to my dissertation first book about the conventions of courtship and changing natures of authority that I wrote uh, way too close to 40 years ago, um, I, I tend to ask how social change happens. And I was writing an army of fire in the shadow of the murder of George Floyd um, during the Black Lives Matter protest as people were demanding change. And, and that had me thinking in different ways about that fundamental question, how does social change happen? So here in general, I'm, you know, I argue as most people would that change comes from the struggles of those who seek change. But in the end, and I don't think anybody much would disagree, that's not sufficient for, for change to make any real difference. It's got to be integrated into a society's culture. Um, and critically here for me, it has to be implemented through a society's key institutions. So in this book, what I'm doing is working from the claim that the opportunities for change and the, the limits on them are in, in significant and fundamental ways determined by the ways that an institution defines its basic mission purpose, by the regulations and the practices and procedures that govern its actions, by how it understands its own culture and history, and in short, by a sort of institutional logic. So during the Vietnam era, the U.S. Army was a massive and significant institution. More than 9 million Americans served and they came from a much greater range of American backgrounds and households than they did in the subsequent all-volunteer force. So what I'm arguing here is that this is a significantly important institution and that in this era, the U.S. Army's own institutional logic made the problem of race unavoidable. So, okay, set the scene. By the cusp of the 1970s, the U.S. Army is not only fighting a foreign enemy, in Southeast Asia, it's being torn apart within, I mean, hence the title, An Army of Fire. Vietnam, August 1968, even as tanks were rolling through the streets of Chicago at the Chicago Democratic National Convention, 200 Black prisoners seized control of the Army jail at Long Bin. These men burned buildings, they attacked guards and fellow prisoners, they left the commander who went in there because he felt like he had created a strong enough relationship with the men who were incarcerated there that he was going to be able to talk to them and stop the violence. They left him with permanent brain damage. Uh, those men beat one white private to death with a shovel and they held that jail for three weeks. In 1970 at Fort Carson, Colorado, a white soldier who for some reason was working part time as a filling station attendant killed the head of the Black Studies program at a local university. Okay. And, you know, an incident. But things escalated. 
35 MPs ended up facing off against 150 black soldiers who were armed with handguns and a stash of M1 carbine. Dong Tom Base Camp in Vietnam's Mekong Delta had wrote what they called roving gangs of black soldiers who were attacking white soldiers at random. The next year in South Korea, 100 black soldiers attacked a local bar that had shifted its focus from black soldiers to white. These black and white soldiers in conflict carried violence into the property of local Korean civilian business owners, and those Korean residents started fighting back. And then they marched in protest, carrying signs saying, in, in the politer signs, things like, go back to cotton field. It ended up requiring high-level diplomacy to resolve it. First Cavalry Division's camp in the Central Highlands, Republic of Vietnam, a first sergeant ordered a black soldier into the field with his platoon, and the soldier refused. He said, you stop effing with us, rabbit. Um, he didn't actually say effing. We are black men and it don't matter. That afternoon, when the troop commander stepped in, that soldier fired an automatic burst from his M16 at close range into the commander's head. And when a staff sergeant tried to cover the body with the poncho, the man who shot him shouted, don't cover the rabbit up. All you rabbits take a good look. That's what we're going to do to all you rabbits. By 1972 in West Germany, Officers and NCOs had begun refusing to enter the barracks unless they were armed. A white NCO told a reporter in West Germany, race is my problem, not the Russians, not Vietnam, race. Now, obviously, these explosions of conflict often um, provoked by white soldiers, often in response to young men who were not eager to be serving in the U.S. military in the first place, reacting in ways that their fathers and grandfathers had not reacted, refusing to put up with the discrimination and racism that existed within the society and within the U.S. Army. These incidents were becoming so pronounced, so violent, so uncontrollable, that many people in positions of leadership in the U.S. Army were getting to the point where they didn't believe that this was something that could be handled by usual. Now, these explosions of violence, this story of the U.S. Army in crisis, it wasn't supposed to be that way. There was a narrative of success in the integration of the U.S. military in general, the U.S. Army in particular. Time Magazine, 1966, quotation, despite a few blemishes, the armed forces remain the model of a reasonably integrated society that the U.S. looks forward to in a new generation. A documentary aired in 1967 about U.S. combat troops in Vietnam titled Same Mud, Same Blood. Takeaway, what the Army has achieved is what America, despite bigots Negro and white, hopes someday to achieve. The elimination of race is a factor in human existence. A bit of an overclaim there. Okay. But these visions of the U.S. military and the U.S. Army in particular as a model for race relations was endorsed as well by Black leaders in, until that narrative was disrupt, disrupted by the rise of Black power. Okay. Some of this language makes a little bit of sense compared to what's happening in civilian society by 1966-67. It's a series of racial uprisings. 170 cities are in flames by... 1967. But there's an, a quiet and growing crisis in the army, addressed in an ad hoc fashion, which begins to increase in, in, in strength and violence after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. In 1969, General William Westmoreland, who was by then back from Vietnam, he's now the chief of staff of the army, assigns his staff to study what he sees as an emerging problem. Um, and in October 1969, Stanley Reeser, the Secretary of the Army, gives his major speech to the Association of the U.S. Army. And he says, basically in this speech, that the racial crisis is second only to Vietnam in terms of the challenges the Army faced. The Army had to address it. And Reeser did two things in this speech that were critically important. First of all, he offered a reason for attention to race. It made sense in the context of army logic, not based on vague claims that social justice is important 
or, or by the moral and ethical claims that he likely realized. Instead, he said, do not misunderstand me. The army does not view itself as an institution of social reform. That is not our charge. But we cannot ignore the realities of the society in which we live. If ignored, those realities can lessen our ability to defend the nation. Army budget. Second, he rejected the notion that the army was colorblind. And, and this is more important. He also rejected the idea that it should be colorblind. This is the Secretary of the Army, 1969. Occasionally, one hears a commander say, with the best of intentions, for me, there's only one color, and that's OD, olive drill, army green. Yes, absolutely, he said. When we're talking about treating everyone equally, sure. But he told the AUSA members there in D.C., quote, a Negro in uniform does not cease to be a Negro and become a soldier instead. He becomes a Negro soldier. And I'll just stop to note that that word is a, the equivalent of in terms of being respectful to African-American today. Reeser insisted we have to recognize race. Okay, reiterate. Yeah, top army leaders act for moral and ethical conventions, convictions. Um, all soldiers in the U.S. Army deserve equality of treatment. But the reason they focus so much on race is because of institutional needs. If racial conflict poses a threat to mission, to stability, to efficiency, to readiness, the U.S. Army has to solve the problem. Okay, so how do they try to deal with it? What struck me most, and I said this before, was how creative they were to the extent that they were willing to challenge fundamental principles of, of how the Army functioned. I have to stop and make sure that I'm clear that there was plenty of resistance. There was disagreement about method. There was both individual and institutional racism, and the people who were charged with addressing the crisis in the army used those terms at the time. But there was also considerable change. There were successes. Okay, so in this book, what I do is to trace first the growing visibility of racial conflict and spend a lot of time talking about the conditions that prompted it, most of which had deep roots in discrimination both in, in the U.S. Army and in U.S. society. Then I analyze how the U.S. Army defined the problem that they perceived. And then I try to trace and analyze the various ways they tried to solve it. Um, the things I talked about were leadership and command responsibility, education and training, culture and identity, uh, the problem of off-post discrimination, particularly in West Germany and Korea, um, military justice and military justice reform, and the rise of affirmative action, which normally at that point had an S on it because it wasn't mainly about uh, race conscious admissions, but it was anything that was done proactively to increase uh, racial comedy. OK, um, if I have time, do I have time? Um, I, I want to just give you a real brief overview of one of the approaches so you can sort of see how it fits together with notions of, um, of institutional logic. OK, so. People are charged with trying to solve this problem, as it's been defined, racial violence, uh, racial conflict. And, and the U.S. Army as an institution has specific and, and really powerful tools it can bring to bear. It's an institution that's built on principles of command, of rank hierarchy, of obedience. When superiors issue orders, subordinates are required to obey them. And, and as the Army creates specific and detailed regulations, its members are required to follow them. And, and if people don't do so, there are consequences for that. There's nothing in civilian society that compares to the power or to the reach of military command. Soldiers belong to the army 24 hours a day. I mean, the possibilities are really amazing. So a commander who is intent on, quote, solving the problem phrase might not change hearts and minds, but he, and, and, and in this case, it was virtually always he, almost certainly could change behavior. So given that kind of authority, it's, it's not at all surprising that the first thing army leaders look to when they're trying to figure out what to do about this is, is leadership, command responsibility. The centrality of command is an essential piece of the army's institutional logic and organization practice. But as those people charged with solving the problem, those people who are trying to struggle with racial crisis, um, they start to realize that army structures of command for all their utility aren't exactly an unmixed 
I mean, first and most basically, the commanders, I mean, whether they led a platoon or brigade or division, these people are human. They're products of a society divided by race, and, and the great majority of them are white. Anybody who had significant authority in the army at the cusp of the 1970s had come of age before Rosa Parks refused to move to the back of the bus before brave teenagers had integrated Little Rock High School, before four college students had sat down in the segregated Woolworths lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina, before a quarter million Americans came together uh, in the march on Washington for jobs and freedom. Those few senior officers who were black, and it was very few people, had risen in rank through talent and ability, but part of that ability was to to navigate what was a heavily white dominated institution. By the end of the 1960s, some white officers really supported racial justice. Others, you know, not so much. But even those people well into positive territory were shaped by their upbringing and some of their blind spots are things that are shocking to people looking back from 2023. Okay, second, even though the chain of command and the ability to issue orders was a great advantage over civilian society, it also presented a structural problem. Each step going down the chain of command offered potential for things to go wrong. Um, I mean, it's not intention that matters, it's implementation, and things didn't always get implemented according to intention. And, and maybe even more problematic, each step up the chain of command gave subordinates a chance to know, shift the narrative, to obscure a problem. I mean, there was not a reward for noting that the sky was falling, even if it's true. Uh, subordinates often found they had lots of incentive to downplay the negative, sidetrack complaints, minimize crises, just like they had incentive to inflate body count in combat or exaggerate the success of the mission. And significantly, this is the 1970s, um, which having been a teenager then, I can say it was kind of an odd era. Um, it's important to recognize that broader social understanding shape approaches and goals. And just as uh, young black soldiers often were drawing upon the understandings and ideals of black power, uh, army leaders were often drawing, um, and those people who were charged with this were drawing on the idea of communication being central and emerging army wisdom is that the problem of race was really a failure of communication, which is not actually a very good diagnosis. So what that led to, is, is senior officials, um, senior officers, two and three star generals, communicating directly, starting the chain of command and going directly to those at the very bottom of the hierarchy to try to improve communication. At Fort Carson, um, members of the Race Relations Council, almost all of them privates, met with the post commander every single day. Now, this is a bit of a problem. Um, NCOs and junior officers found their authority undercut. Um, and on the other side, some of those privates, uh, you know, it's a little bit like children of divorced parents, um, realizing that they can just kind of walk around the people who have been telling them what to do and go to somebody else and get a different and, and superior answer. Um, sometimes let it go to their heads, as it were. But this is the point. The strategy was based in a faith and leadership. I mean, the whole idea was to identify charismatic young black men. Um, the army called them, quote, natural leaders and, and in a way co-opt them. But I would say the outcomes were a lot more nuanced than that. Um, sometimes it led to relationships of trust that, that lasted for decades. And in some cases, it led to senior officers developing, developing and acting on a much greater commitment to racial equality in Army people. Okay, so the most fundamental of Army principles, leadership and command responsibility, justified a creative solution that defied a fundamental Army principle, the importance of rank hierarchy, even as it is based in one of the Army's most fundamental principles, faith in the importance of leadership. Um, I'll stop there. If anybody wants, I can talk in, in more detail about some of the other approaches, but that gives a little bit of a sense of the approach. And the only other thing I'll say is that I've been talking a lot in abstractions here, and, and the book is full of people. Um, it's, it, it illustrates points, it's an argument, but there are people acting in these roles and there are lots of stories about how and why people took the action. Okay, now I'll stop. Thank you so much, Beth.
Before we move on, let me just remind folks in the audience that if you wish, you can get into the queue now by using the raise hand function or the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your screen. Our discussant this afternoon is Gregory A. Dadis, Professor of History and the USS Midway Chair in Modern U.S. Military History at San Diego State University. He joined San Diego State after directing the MA program in War and Society Studies at Chapman University, and prior to that, he served as the Chief of the American History Division of the Department of History at the United States Military Academy at West Point. A retired U.S. Army colonel, he deployed to both Operations Desert Storm and Iraqi Freedom, and he specializes in the history of the Vietnam Wars and the Cold War era and has authored five books, including Pulp Vietnam, War and Gender in Cold War Men's Adventure Magazines, published in 2020, and Withdrawal, Reassessing America's Final Years in Vietnam, published in 2017. He is the recipient of the Fulbright Distinguished Scholar Award in 2022-23 uh, from Pembroke College at the University of Oxford. Gregory, welcome to the Washington History Seminar. Thanks, Eric. I really appreciate it. Uh, and hello to everyone. Um, and hi, Beth, in particular. Um, so thanks to Eric and, and Christian for the kind invitation and, and most certainly to the Wilson Center for hosting this series. Um, I got to tell you, it's, it's always a pleasure to speak with colleagues who you admire greatly. And, and Beth most certainly uh, falls into that category. I've read all of her work. I've used it in my research. I've taught it in my classes at both undergraduate and graduate levels. So um, this is a, a real treat for me. Um, so having said that, I'm going to start with a really, really awful review of Best Book. So this bad review was published in, in the American Conservative, and it was really, really bad. Um, like so bad, it likely wears socks with sandals. Like, like this review was so bad, it watches Steven Seagal movies. It was really, really bad. And what the reviewer was arguing, and, and unfortunately, I think as most of us kind of will find often that reviewers will really in their review speak more about themselves than the, the book that's been being reviewed. What the reviewer was arguing that that an army of fire was this warning sign, an example of how this woke liberal army was trying to control Americans during the 1960s by, by telling them not only what uniform to wear, but forcing them, teaching them that, that racism was bad. And, and so best book becomes in this review a, a warning sign for today as, as liberals are trying apparently to do the same thing for Americans. So I, I wanted to start there because I'm going to circle back around to that um, because I do think it's an important part of um, not necessarily best argument, but I think an, an understanding that why um, as Beth mentioned, there is some resistance to some of these changes that are um, the army is seeking in the 60s and 70s. So alongside that one argument, I, I think, is another one in the literature itself. And there is a strain in, in the um, historiography of, of the American experience in Vietnam that argues the U.S. Army in particular um, lost the war in Vietnam because it was not a learning organization, that it was somehow wedded to this conventional concept of warfare that was rooted in the World War II experience. It no longer applied to the unconventional environment of Vietnam. And that was the reason why the army lost in Vietnam. And I think that is an equally bad argument. And in fact, the army spent a tremendous amount of time trying to learn about this new environment that was as much political as it was military. They were trying to share lessons learned. They were trying to grapple with the difficulties of fighting a war that was at once conventional as it was unconventional, that it was, as I mentioned, more political in many instances than it was military. And clearly that was a, a very different type of war than Americans confronted during the Second World War. And yet, Despite some of this argumentation you see in the literature, I, I think the Army absolutely, genuinely was committed to learning in this environment. We, we all know, those of us who study war, that it is chaotic, and, and purposefully so. And in that environment, I think learning is inherent to success. But I, I think, um, as the Army found in Vietnam, learning was also no guarantee of achieving success. And so I, I think when you put those two strands together, right, that 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 as the army is grappling with its 
Um, it's problems of race, as Beth mentioned. Um, there are concerns, uh, especially from more conservative Americans, that that um, the Army is using its organization as a social laboratory alongside this other strain in the literature that the Army lost in Vietnam because it wasn't a learning or organization. What I found most fascinating about an Army of Fire was, and, and I think what Beth does so incredibly well, is share how the Army actually was attempting to learn to, to grapple with these really intricate problems of race. Um, at the same time, they were also trying to deal with these very complex problems of counterinsurgency warfare. And, and I think it's important for us to note that, uh, and I think Beth rightfully did so during her comments, that this clearly is a social problem. But we also need to realize that this is an organization that's trying to deal with some of those social problems as it's trying to fight and withdraw from um, what will likely be its first losing war, um, most certainly um, in the 20th century. Um, and so to me, I, I think this is much a story about learning uh, about war in the Vietnam era as it is about race and the larger relationships between war and society in the 1960s and the 1970s. And you know what I think is fascinating here is and Beth mentioned this, that the military leaders were, were seeing these racial problems and, and their attempts to solve them as crucial to defending the nation. And, and, and to me, this is a really, I think, important part of the, the central argument in an army of fire is that th this was really a serious, if not existential problem that military leaders were confronting. They, they saw it as potentially undermining their very ability to achieve a central mission, their central purpose, which was to defend the nation. Um, and again, I find that to be somewhat remarkable as the army is winding down from this, this long and, and, and divisive conflict in Southeast Asia. And so to me, I think there's something we can all learn here about organizational culture um, and how organizational culture, especially in the armed forces, is placed on top of and influences um, larger American culture, and how institutional logic is working with and through, sometimes inhibited by um, that larger American culture as the organization is going through this learning and problem-solving process. Um, and again, what I found fascinating here is having been in on both sides of this from, from the an army perspective and an academia perspective, how hierarchy and authority can both hinder and facilitate change. Um, clearly two very different types of, of um, hierarchical approaches to leadership when you compare um, the armed forces to academia. And in, in many ways, I think you see the, the competing um, imperatives, if you will, of leadership of, of both, as I mentioned, hindering and facilitating change. And, and so I think there's a larger question for us to be asking here about what inspires not just learning, but, but true organizational change. Um, many army leaders saw these racial problems as, as coming from with outside of the organization. You know, my own research, I, I, I saw uh, a number of army leaders complaining about American society as, as um, this permissive state that was having an impact on uh, the potential for discipline with um, maintaining discipline within the ranks. Um, but, but I think it was something more to that, as Beth mentioned, right? That this is a problem in her words that demanded attention, that was inescapable, that pressure was coming from all directions. And, and I think that says something um, about what inspires organizational change. But as Beth mentioned, and I think what she does so well as a historian through all of her works is, is put people at the forefront of the story. So when you look at um, folks like Major Lavelle Merritt, um, he's thinking not just about an inescapable problem that is having an impact potentially on U.S. national security, but quite personally on his manhood. And, and I think that's an, an, another important part here in terms of what's inspiring, um, not just learning, but change. Um, and ultimately, I think that's something very different than how leaders were thinking about the problem, which ultimately was one about morale, low morale in the ranks, 
affecting military effectiveness. And I wonder if that actually had the most sway among senior military commanders, that this was a problem um, affecting military effectiveness. Um, and that's what was inspiring the learning process and change. Alongside of that question of what inspires learning, I, I think, and ben, Beth mentioned this, is, is what inspires resistance? We, we, we see here a, a lack of training and a lack of communication um, inspiring resistance. We see um, in the narrative of, a, of an army of fire, some directorates purposely trying to bury the question of race, um, which is um, as fascinating as it is frightening. You see leaders who are um, lacking the experience to deal with these expressions of dissatisfaction. Um, I think one of the important points here that in, uh, in the book it, that Beth notes is that the grievances are often expressed not with words, but through violence, something that clearly I think we're all seeing unfold today right in front of us. Um, but there's also something here um, in terms of inspiring resistance that is not just uh, from a racial perspective, but also from a generational one. That there is a generational problem here um, that I think is important and potentially, um, I would I would argue, um, incredibly relevant today as we we see um, debates occur across generational boundaries today over what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Um, and finally, and I think this is really fascinating, is that that resistance might in fact come from the limits of leadership itself. I, I think most of us, um, and when I say us, I, I would probably, I, I guess I'm going to generalize here purposely, say most Americans are comfortable in arguing that good leadership can solve just about any problem. Um, but as Beth suggested, it's far more complicated than that. Um, that these race relation councils that were being led by lower ranking enlisted members, they were threatening to commanders. That when, when a, a private or a young specialist is getting more face time with a division commander than a battalion or brigade commander, that in fact can be threatening. And so we, we might extrapolate that argument. And again, I know we need to be careful here in making generalizations, but, but question our faith in, in kind of savior generals turning around stalemated, even losing wars simply by the process of their superb leadership. There are in fact limits to leadership and we need to be okay um, with that proposition. Um, I, I think there's also something deeper here to circle back around to where I started um, and why I did, uh, about the Army being this laboratory for social experimentation. Um, because it's a warning, um, usually from the right, that, that does persist today. Um, we saw it in debates over homosexuality and don't ask, don't tell in the 1980s and 1990s. We saw it as women began to serve more and more in traditionally male-dominated roles within the armed forces, especially combat roles. And we saw see it today um, in debates over transgender service. Um, and the, the counter argument was always the same, that military readiness was going to be undermined if we allowed the armed forces to become this site of um, this laboratory for um, social experimentation. And, and I think we should probably ask why that is such a popular argument. Why is it that standards of morale and discipline and unit cohesion being undermined as a form of resisting social change with the army um, are so powerful? It almost becomes a, a kind of trump card, if you will, um, to, to contest these, um, um, these social changes that are occurring within the military. And, and the last point I'll make here, and I think um, how I think best work fits within the larger literature is one of the books I have my students read in our Warren Society courses, William Taylor's Military Service in American Diplomacy, uh, D D Democracy. And in it, he argues that, that the military, when you look back over the course of the 20th century, oftentimes was a litmus test of American values and served as the nation's conscience. And, and as I was reading in the Army of Fire, I, I wondered about that, that Taylor suggests that there is symbolic power in military service. And in, in some ways, I think he's right, um, as the military is kind of working through becomes this contested area to grapple with these larger values of, of being in a democracy. 
And, and I wonder, and perhaps Beth, we can start here as as, uh, as a kind of conversation of of whether you saw that in your own work. Um, was this debate over um, over the race problem um, wrapped into this larger argument that the that the military was this litmus test for American values? Um, because in many ways, and Beth mentioned this, I do think that. Uh, organizational change in the armed forces can have national ramifications. And I think that's why you see, um, if we go back to our critic from the American conservative, being so concerned about the army being a, a model for others to fi- follow because social change, according to some at least, can be dangerous. And so I, I think what Beth ultimately shows us here is an organization at war. And again, we can't forget that, that the war was still raging while uh, the individuals were in this organization were dealing with this problem of race, we're identifying a problem that that ostensibly was affecting military performance and we're trying their their level best to rectify it. And and not all were on board and some resisted and and at the same time, others were willing to lead and others um, saw education as key. Others thought it was taking attention away from core training requirements and, and many others just weren't sure what to do. And it was complicated, like all history is. And, and I think that's what's such a uh, phenomenal um, uh, part of, of reading this book and, and why I'm um, so glad to be part of this conversation. So I'll turn it over to you all. And thanks so much for the opportunity to, to be a part of this. Thank you. Beth, any thoughts on what we've just heard? Um, well, I mean, just mainly thank you, Greg. That's um as I expected, insightful, and it's giving me things to think about. Um, and I mean, just going back to one of your questions, um, you know, what inspires not just learning, but organizational change? It, it sounds like the most boring pitch for a book ever, but the biggest organizational change I found was bureaucracy. I mean, the, the way that the army really institutionalized change was by bureaucratizing the question of race. And that created an enormous difference. Um, you know, luckily the book isn't, you know, titled an, an army bureaucratized or whatever, but, but that is sort of where I'm going. Um, and, and then litmus test for American democracy. Um, I think that, I mean, that's where to some extent the, uh, reactions came from is that ongoing belief in the United States that male citizenship is linked to the obligations and and then the and responsibilities, but also to the rewards of citizenship. And you know, a whole long list of people, especially African Americans throughout US history, especially 20th century, coming back from war and saying, I have fulfilled my obligations. I deserve, you know, I, I deserve the full rights of citizenship. Vietnam, all that started to pull against each other, um, but there was still the sense that military service was this form in which these are contested. But perhaps even more importantly, what was going on is that the army or the military in general is a very efficient place to target because the changes can be implemented in ways that are much more direct and reach a much larger number of people than trying to say corporations should think about something in this fashion or universities should think about something in this fashion. And so there were a lot of external forces, you know, including the NAACP, um, the the Black Congressional Caucus. um, Lots of people were pushing for change and seeing the military as the most efficient place to do so. A lot of it was coming out of the Department of Defense. I mean, Surprisingly enough, perhaps Richard Nixon's um, Secretary of Defense was was all in, and McNamara was was a profound advocate for changes in, in racial relations in the United States. Um, so I, I don't know that it serves as a litmus test in, of democracy in in the full way um, that Bill Taylor meant it, but I I think that that legacy set up the conflicts within the U.S. Army to be understood from the outside and the inside as critically important, in addition to the fact that they were so disruptive. Um, I worried sometimes that in talking about uh, institutional logic and the way to get people to pay attention to your claims, I sound like I'm saying the way to do it is is to, you know, create so much violence they can't ignore you. And that wasn't the message I was trying to convey with the book. Um, But, you know, that, that is the piece of it is, 
why did people pay attention to what was going on in the army, both internally and externally? And I think that history of litmus, litmus test of democracy plays a role. Sorry, Van. Thank you very much. Let's open this up. We've got a number of people with hands up and a number of questions in the Q&A. So let's start with, I'm going to take these in order. Marcy Reven, if you would unmute yourself, you can pose the question. I take it you're looking to unmute. Tell you what, I'm going to move down. We'll come back to you. Um, hopefully we can resolve that issue. Thomas Schwartz, Tom, join us, please. Yes, um, uh, Beth, I haven't had the chance to read your book, but I teach the Vietnam War and at the Vanderbilt Television Archive, there are a number of really quite striking examples of the racial issues um, that occurred during Vietnam, um, particularly the development of Seoul City in Saigon uh, that was almost off limits to MPs and the rest. But I'm I'm curious as to what the relationship you see between the adoption of the volunteer army and the army's ability to deal with the racial question. Uh, what in, in I, I realize you're the expert in this. Um, do you see them as interconnected um, in terms of the army's success? Did moving to a volunteer army make it uh, more more likely that the army could uh, deal with its racial issues? Um, the counterfactual question: If conscription had remained, would it have been just as difficult? Would it have been more difficult for the army to solve its problem? Mm, that's that's really interesting. So um, yes and no, I think. Um, the move to the all-volunteer force um, eventually is going to make a difference because there are, I mean, first of all, um, one of the reasons that there was so much racial tension among black and white soldiers during the Vietnam era, and and I, it's not only in Vietnam, it's all over the world. I mean, the, the worst of the violence is really in West Germany, um, was because there were so many people who really didn't want to be there. Um, and that level of anger and frustration uh, often fed over into to racial conflict. So moving to an all-volunteer force is going to make a difference there. People are by and large there because they've decided to join. And even if they hate it, they're the ones who joined. Um, it's not going to change immediately because of the things haven't changed fully in society in the 1970s. But as the uh, extreme racial tensions that characterized the late 60s through the sort of early 1970s began to fade, People were coming into the U.S. military without those sets of understandings. Um, and so on the one hand, it probably would have faded away a bit. But the all-volunteer force helped initially because people were coming in of their own volition. And it also helped because, um, by and large, the, the military was able to be more selective about the people that it was bringing in. And so they essentially look for people who had shown the discipline to get a high school diploma, who um, scored well enough on the test so that they felt like they could do the work, and people who, through some sense, gave an indication they wanted to be there, and that's happening by the 19th. So, yes and no. Historian's answer. Good, good. Charles Bowery, your hand is up. Unmute. Join the discussion. Thanks very much. And uh, Beth, thanks very much for your presentation as always. Uh, I'm very interested in your, uh, in your, in your construct of an institutional logic. Uh, and I'm curious whether in your, uh, in your research and writing of an army of fire that you, uh, that you explored the sort of institutional relationship between these race relations policies that were aimed at quelling racial conflict and, and what came later in the 1970s and 80s in terms of, of moving more to, uh, to race relations, to affirmative actions, uh, and to uh, eventually to equal opportunity programs. Yeah, um, thanks. So 
the book really is focused on the Vietnam era and I don't trace it forward that much. Um, but key to this, as you know, was the move of the Defense Race Relations Institute, which trained people to educate um, and train soldiers. And well, actually it was, it was a service wide um, turning into the Equal Opportunity Management Institute. So there is a shift away from simply race relations and attempting to manage black, white racial violence to thinking about equal opportunity, which is defined much more broadly, both in terms of race and ethnicity, but in particular in terms of gender. So that's going to matter a great deal. So that is happening. And and what I'm seeing um, by the 1973 or so is the establishment of an um, Army, at the direction of the Department of Defense, an Army Affirmative Actions Program, which goes all the way from uh, race conscious admissions to the military academies and attempting to foster uh, race conscious admissions uh, within universities for um, ROTC, but also with things like, you know, sponsor sports teams in neighborhoods and cities that have lots of uh, African American residents. So, again, a much broader understanding of affirmative actions than the action than we think now. But but this was the origin of thinking hard about how to produce the future officer corps, something that I know you're very much interested in. Um, and, you know, counting up the, the extraordinarily extraordinary scarcity of, of black leaders and black officers in an institution that has to grow their own. So the beginnings of programs that are going to come to fruition a couple of decades hence and continue um, have their roots in this moment. Carol McKibben, your hand is up. Please unmute. Unmute. Okay. Um, hi, Beth. Uh, somehow I'm not showing. Can you hear me? We can hear you. We cannot see you, but we're not supposed to see you. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, just your voice. I'm sorry that I put makeup on then. Um, so I wrote about Fort Ord and its relationship to the adjacent community of Seaside. And I wonder, and one of the surprising things I found when I did that research, it was called, it, the book was called Racial Beachhead. Um, I used your work heavily, Beth. I relied on it enormously. Um, was I what I was very surprised to see the positives there, especially among African American women who were spouses of uh, uh, high ranking officers and other personnel. And uh, oh, <laughs> and um, I'm wondering if you could speak to that a little bit, because I was really expecting to find a lot of negativity about race. But what I found was that this was a place in Fort Ord and Seaside that offered both uh, socioeconomic mobility to African-Americans at mid-century and uh it also offered more than that for their spouses and families to become active civil rights uh, actors when the they were they were in other words protected by the military for doing so. So I'm wondering if you could complicate the uh, analysis of race to include that kind of part of it. Uh, I know this is coming out kind of awkwardly, but oh, no, not a bit. And you know, so. One of the things that I think is so interesting and, you know, your work and, and others is the ways in which the military and the federal government acted as a limited guarantor of at least the ability to speak and a, a, a grantor of a kind of alternate status for people of color um, who could claim that identity. Um, and how much it varied by where you are. Um, you know, the period that I'm writing about is is a period that was highly racially explosive in most of American society. But, you know, think about 1968, the, you know, Jim Crow is not illegal for that long by that point. And so, and many of the, the bases and posts that were created for, for training, the ones that most soldiers are going to go through and for Fort Ord is important, but, you know, they're going to go for basic training down in, in the deep South where is, you know, not only is the, the the practice of discrimination and segregation um, alive, but until very recently, it's been legal. So 
you know, I, I think it matters enormously where one is. And I mean, it's uh, Greg made a very good point about leadership isn't going to solve everything. But I do think that one of the lessons that I come away from this, and that doesn't in, in any way contradict what he said, is that individuals matter and communities matter. And so when people are able to take where they are and create um, a, a, an atmosphere that allows for change, that allows for engagement, that that can continue. That can make an enormous difference. So I'm, I'm really aware that of trying not to treat the U.S. Army, even though I'm writing about the U.S. Army as an institution, trying not to treat it as this sort of faceless monolithic block. I mean, the U.S. Army can't talk, um, right? It's people within the army are are functioning in different ways. And, you know, I think that your work is an, an enormously important explanation of the ways in which it, it wasn't just a story of, of negative results and, and military status could make a difference in positioning people to, to campaign for, for racial justice and equal rights. I mean, I hope that it goes toward answering your question. So let me pick up on a theme um, that you mentioned. You were talking about uh, bases in the South uh, and the communities into which these soldiers find themselves. Um, some who have never experienced this level of intense community racism uh, before. And I'm thinking uh, back to uh, my colleague Thomas Guillermo's work uh, about the Second World War. Um, and then the military officials couldn't care less, you know, where people are based. It's like you go there and you will put up with and deal with um, whatever it is that you have to deal with. But this is several decades later. Um, and since Truman's efforts to begin desegregating uh, the armed forces, it just strikes me that there's a belated recognition that sending people to the Deep South um, in a period in which, A, Jim Crow is still intact, and then it's being dismantled by civil rights laws, but these white communities are the, in no way welcoming and quite, quite hostile. Uh, and so I realize that, as you point out, that racism exists everywhere in the United States, but it's kind of more intense in some communities than it is in others. And so could you talk about the realization uh, on the part of uh, military officials about sending Black soldiers uh, into communities that are going to hate them, humiliate them, subject them to all sorts of forms of, of degradation. Uh, and, and you do show this in the book, what they begin to do about it. So why, what I call the kind of belated recognition, and then what they do to at least attempt to address this issue. Now, that's one of the really difficult, um, that was one of the really difficult chapters because it is obvious how much it made a difference that a black service member stepping off post, he or she entered a different world. Um, he or she was subject to the legal and, and cultural understandings over which the military command had no control. And, and that's where it gets complicated because I mean, there's a reason that military commanders don't have control over the civilian populations uh, adjoining the post. But at the same time, what does it mean for, for their soldier to be treated as a second class citizen, to be subject to discrimination? Um, the commander of a post needs to keep on good terms with the people in the surrounding communities for all sorts of reasons. But what does it mean when th their soldiers are going to be treated as second class citizens? What can they do? How should they behave? And it led to some of the most fascinating back and forth that I found in my research, trying to figure out how to do this. Uh, there was a lot of sort of moral suasion talk, a lot of, of you know, we're, we're going to have dinners with real, real estate brokers and, and the mayor and try to, you know, just sort of gently make, make them understand how important it is, but we can't exercise authority. It became even more complicated in places like West Germany, where there was an extraordinary level of discrimination against black service members. And they had no black community to go to. I mean, one this is not in any way justifying any of this, but in Southern communities, there was usually a substantial black community where black service members found places that they were welcome. Um, they should not have had to seek 
other places to be welcome. They should have been, you know, had equal access to everything. But in places like West Germany, there was no such community. There might have been a strip of bars that were, you know, labeled for, for black soldiers, but it's not the same thing. And and so it turned into, you know, massive diplomatic uh, negotiations between the two countries trying to figure out how to handle these problems. Um, it was one of the naughtiest issues that they existed because the military, while it's a separate institution, is not fully separate from the society that it serves. Thank you. Uh, Amit Ahuja, if you would unmute, pose a question. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, lovely. Uh, first, Beth, thank you for a wonderful, wonderful book. I, I am so grateful. I have so enjoyed reading it. Thank I have you. a question, um, which which may be slightly unfair, but but um, but I'd like I'd like you to sort of think about it. You know, you talk so much about the lessons that the military, especially the army, learns as it grapples with the racial crisis during Vietnam. Given this experience, um, you know, uh, why, you know, how how has this kind of learning experience or this, the, the approaches that came out of this experience, how did they influence our approach in building new armies where we were grappling with similar ethnic differences in Afghanistan and Iraq? And because, you know, those experiences have not gone that well. So just, you know, you know, I wonder if you have any reflections on that. Well, that is um, an extremely important question and one that I don't have answers to, obviously. But my, my sense as a historian is that things are so culturally specific that the approaches that were tried in the 1970s in the U.S. Army probably don't even translate that well to the army of the 21st century. Um, I don't see necessarily that the, the attempts to make a difference in terms of, of racial discrimination and, and, and racial equity in the army translated even all that well to the notion of, um, you know, incorporating transgender people serving openly or um, and certainly didn't work all that well when they were trying to think about how to incorporate women into the regular functioning of the U.S. Army and, and gender integration. Um, so, you know, what what I what I value is the evidence that the army leaders charged with this action were able to think creatively. But and I value the notion that the U.S. Army emphasizes the diversity of its membership as one of its greatest strengths. But I think it also lacks sufficient understanding of the culture and history of many other societies, especially those in which, as you said, um, it was trying to help build armies. And, and I think that uh, the diverse, the understanding of diversity is highly insular in terms of living in the United States. So it's a great question. So I'm turning to some of the questions that have been posed in the Q&A. And Robert Harris asks one that I think you touch upon in multiple chapters of your book. Um, and it would be valuable to hear you, you talking about these. Uh, what about fragging, he says, relations on military bases, housing, and schools? I mean, much of what you write about are these very subjects. So if you could just say a little bit more about these things, We'd appreciate. Yes. Um, one, uh, one of the key sets of concerns was uh, discrimination that affected people's housing, that affected the schools that their, their children were able to go to, um, and trying to figure out how to address those problems. And when people were off post, there, was, there were efforts to try and make things better on post. Um, but as the army is growing and growing, it's no longer quite possible to house everybody on post. And 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 the the army, the Department of Defense, does turn to off limits practices to try to force landlords to uh, accept the racial integration and to put their their holdings off limits if they don't. Um, bragging. Um, I mean, the book is full of incidents of racial violence. Most of the ones that I talked about at the beginning were black soldiers um, who were 
who were exercising violence. Um, and I emphasize that sometimes that violence was provoked and sometimes it was a, a broader response and sometimes it was just plain violence. Um, fraggings were a concern. Uh, they grew enormously, but you know, it was all part of a larger pattern of indiscipline within the army that was by no means restricted to racial conflict between black and white soldiers. Um, you know, some fraggings were certainly race motivated, but an awful lot of them were you know, just against officers who were attempting to make their soldiers do things that they saw as threatening to their 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 lives um, or uh, otherwise. So, uh, you know, the, the, the theme of violence and the theme of discrimination and limited opportunities runs through all of the chapters, and each chapter sort of takes those as a starting point and then looks at the attempted solutions beyond the Army Thank you. We have a number of questions that speak to related themes, so I'm going to combine several. Um, Robert Jefferson writes, Professor Bailey, thank you for your fascinating discussion and such a wonderful book. As someone who has studied these issues for some time, I wonder about how the U.S. Army's efforts to affect change in race relations in the ranks uh, was seen abroad. So it's a two-part question he asks. First, how were the U.S. Army's efforts to affect changes in race relations viewed by its allies and adversaries abroad in the 1970s? And second, to what degree was American senior military leadership conscious of how these changes were being perceived at this time. Uh, and then a related question comes from Hope Harrison, who asks that you say something more about the approach and reforms on culture and identity. And she asks about the West German uh, example in particular, in which the army uh, introduced uh, uh, barbers uh, for black soldiers uh, and brought in a larger uh, range of foods for the common uh, for for the commissary. So different questions about issues overseas that are in some way related. Right. And so, I mean, Professor Jefferson, um, you know, an enormous amount more than I do about this topic. Um, in terms of allies and adversaries, uh, you know, it, it led to high level diplomatic negotiations, uh, both in West Germany and in Korea, um, where the level of violence and, and uh, that spilled off post required uh, high level attempts to manage it. Um, in terms of thinking of it in as uh, the army attempting to ameliorate race relations, um, I haven't found anything in particular about that. That doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, but it's not something that I came across. Um, and in terms of uh, like the identity, it, it seems strange in the midst of the U.S. war in Vietnam, in the midst of the turmoil, uh, the Cold War turmoil in, in West Germany, et cetera, that so many young men cared so enormously about expressions of identity. But it was an era of, uh, of cultural nationalism. It was an era in which people, especially young black men, wanted to make clear that to clear their identity and not to subsume that identity in the soldier. But part of what happened is when I was talking about Secretary Reeser's claims, which actually came from um, a, a, a black lieutenant colonel who was the head of the committee that, that wrote the report he was basing this on, thinking about the, the notion of being colorblind, of seeing only one color, it became really clear that being colorblind defaulted white. So the 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 term for the standard army haircut was white wall, which you know gives you some sense for what they were thinking. Um, uh, black soldiers had to pay more for getting their hair cut because it was considered a specialty cut. I mean, uh, PXs didn't carry the kinds. I mean, not only music and and magazines and such, but even the the personal care products that um, African Americans commonly bought. So. So that recognition of identity was something that the PX in part uh, tried to claim responsibility for and, and made a huge difference. It's the fourth largest retail institution in the world. And it starts buying uh, all of these products produced by black companies, keeping them in stock. Um, you know, it, it changed to some extent the landscape of, of black entrepreneurship, but it also changed the opportunities that were available to young black men and, and women. Um, where the army started to draw the line was, uh, you know, expressions of identity that 
you know, were wearing things that um, were not approved to wear with the, with the uniform or black power salutes instead of the traditional salute or dapping for a long time. And you know, they experimented with allowing that. But once they started to say that one culture was OK, then you get like white Southerners saying, well, I want to observe my culture, too. And the most important thing of my culture is the Confederate battle flag. And that didn't exactly improve race relations. So to put a lid on that one. So Hope Harrison has a follow-up, but now her hand is up, so all she has to do is unmute. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for a fascinating talk. Um, I'm particularly interested in what you've said about West Germany, and um, you, you talk about how there was the most violence there. Um, and... And I, that certainly was the case, but it wasn't quite the whole story. There were also many Blacks who stayed on and who even deserted um, because they felt more comfortable in West Germany than back home in the U.S. on racial issues. Uh, it was also the case that many um, of the student protesters of the late 60s and early 70s um, bonded with many of the Black GIs, and they had some joint demonstrations, including in Heidelberg. So I'm wondering, you know, do you write about these things? Um, I, I do write about those things, but I'm sorry. When I said violence, I meant within the military itself. Yes, I understand that. Oh, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I didn't mean that violence, um, you know, of, of of German nationals against African Americans. I think, um, yes, I, I I interviewed people um, who who left the army and spent the rest of their lives in West Germany. Um, I do write a lot about the the um, the, the common cause made at times between uh, German student groups um, who who, in many cases. Very much adopted the language of of black power and cultural nationalism, although sometimes in in language that was highly um, condescending and demeaning toward the black troops that they were trying to make common cause with. Um, but, but yeah, I mean it, it was it was a mixed set of experiences for people. But I think that coming out of World War II, a lot of black Americans had a picture of Germany that was grounded in a sense um, of the experience in the occupation. And when they found themselves in West Germany in the 1970s, when uh, the dollar didn't go so far, um, and there was a good deal of racial conflict within the U.S. military, the experience often didn't live up to the, the hopes that they had had for that, that place. Um, but, you know, what you say is, uh, you know, e extremely important. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to downplay but. I just did want to make clear that I was talking about violence between black and white soldiers um, and not violence uh, you know, among the German population. Thank you. I understood that that's what you meant. Thank you okay. so much. Thanks. David Anderson has a hand up. Please unmute. Hello. Uh, hello, Beth, and uh, hello, Greg. Uh, good to see both of you, and thank you for this most insightful discussion. Uh, I wanted to share uh, my eyewitness experience. I was in a combat base in Fubai in 1970, and uh, I was a sergeant, so I was dealing with some of these issues firsthand as an NCO. And I saw what I, at the time, interpreted as institutional um, segregation, that is the Signal Corps unit that was on one side of the road was predominantly white, the infantry unit on the other side of the road was predominantly black, they shared a common mess hall. The troops got along, but there was segregation, uh, spontaneous segregation in the mess hall. Blacks eating with blacks, whites eating with whites. And I interpreted that as a reflection of society. Uh, and the dealt, problems I dealt with were more two things, drugs and the fact that most of the soldiers were by that time becoming very critical of the war, the, the, the young men in the, in the ranks. So the issue of conflating race and drugs and uh, youthful rebellion, all of those things must be an incredibly complicated issue for you to to unravel. And uh, Beth, I really appreciate what, what you've done. And I, 
um, wondering about um, the degree to which these other factors like drugs and simply uh, youthful rebellion factor into to this uh, your conclusions. Yeah, thank you. Um, it bedevils those people who were so because there was so much racial conflict um, at various level units were charged with keeping records of racial conflict and racial violence and people kept asking well how are we supposed to tell I and mean, you know if a black and a white soldier gets in a fist fight is it racial or you know is it just like you know somebody you know stumbled and knocked somebody over or somebody doesn't like someone um how do you how do we separate separate out this kind of uh you know new young soldier who is questioning the the reason for this war and questioning orders and how do we deal with um what is drug motivated so, I mean, not only did I have trouble sorting it out, as you clearly are saying, the people at the time had trouble sorting it out, too. Um, part of what I'm doing is looking at what they decided, um, not not drawing conclusions that say, obviously, this was race, but but trying to analyze what made them make the decisions they made. And, and that's what I'm trying to do in the book. Um, but I, I think sometimes the decisions they made might not have been clearly right. But that's that's what I'm trying to analyze. But thank you. John Martin, please unmute. Thank you. Uh, this I just bought your book, Beth, and I'm really looking forward to it. I, I was stationed in Germany in the uh, early 60s and edited an army newspaper. And I'm wondering, as Christian often asks, what, what best sources you might have on that? Has anybody written about race problems in the army in Germany uh, in that era? In the early 60s. Um, so there there are a couple of works. Um, Maria, Maria Hohn and Martin Klimke have written um, about uh, the U.S. military, the army in Germany, and go back a little bit. Um, I'm not sure how much they covered that initial era, um, but that might be an interesting place to look. Uh, my my work is really pretty much sixty six board. So some of the people that you know you you had uh, interactions with may still be around in in the era I was looking at. Um, oh, there is a book. Um, I can't remember the title of it right now, but there is a book about that era. Um, let me look for it and and I will try and um, send you an email uh, with it. I'm just sorry, I'm blanking on the title. Thank you. Charles Bowery uh, has some follow-ups, um, slightly different. He says, did the African-American officers you wrote about see themselves as connected in any way to the Black Power movement or the enlisted soldiers, for that matter? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that um, Greg pointed out was the generational divide. And yeah, that becomes critically important here. Um, often Black officers, especially as they moved up the ranks, didn't didn't have a lot of sympathy for the claims of young black enlisted men. Um, they didn't have a lot of sympathy with a uh, worldview they were promoting, which is not to say that many of them didn't, um, you know, it, it's not to say that they weren't concerned about the existence of discrimination um, and the limited opportunities that African-Americans had had in the military especially given the uh, ways in which promotions fell off so dramatically for Black men as they moved up the ranks. Um, but, you know, it was a question of, of method and style, and it was a question of officer versus enlisted. So um, I haven't found a lot of officers who were embracing ideas of Black power. Uh, some of them did say that they thought it was important that uh, you know, Black enlisted men be able to have study groups and to talk about these issues without being harassed by MPs. But I am large, um, I mean, I, I find uh, circumstances all too frequently in which, you know, there's a black and a white commander, uh, you know, the same the, the same post and the, the African-American officer is much less willing to give leeway to the black and the folk than the white for reasons that are obviously complicated. Catherine Stock poses this question. In Bring the War Home, 
Kathleen Bailu argues that the white power movement grew in part from anger and disaffection of some white veterans that they felt uh, at the end of the Vietnam War when, as they saw it, Asian people and countries humiliated white Americans. Do you think that the efforts to improve race relations in the military may have also played a part in the rise of the white nationalist movements that she studies? This is a bit beyond what you do in the book, but you know the subject. I mean, it's it's quite a different argument than I make. Um, it's, she's she's looking at, at at something quite different. But I, I will say is that some of the techniques that were embraced by those people who were trying to address the racial crisis probably exacerbated racial conflict um, in efforts to deal with the racial crisis through education and training. There was a very reasonable. Uh, understanding that everybody should understand the history of African-American experiences in the United States and the fundamental fact of slavery and this continued legal and, and cultural discrimination. Um, but it being the 1970s uh, and them thinking creatively, they tended to embrace sensitivity training in key groups, um, which can be catastrophic when led by people without enough experience. And so uh, you know, they would go into units that were functioning fine, don't know what was in people's hearts, but they were getting along and pushed people to the point that somebody said something that couldn't be taken back. Um, you know, used the N word, uh, said something just, you know, unacceptable, and 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 threw things into a mess. Um, so, and and some, I'm sure that there are some white soldiers who found themselves in situations in which there were black enlisted men who were sort of randomly attacking white enlisted men, which did happen, um, who who came away with, you know, not a greater understanding of the larger circumstances in which these men functioned, but uh, an anger that could lead to embracing ideas of white nationalism. I never saw any direct evidence of that, um, but I was looking at the Army's control and the Army's responses. And so, um, you know, that would be an interesting question to ask her. She may have seen such Although I imagine if she had really seen that, it would have been one of the book. So, so this touches on something that I was thinking about in in reading the book, and that is, there are any of us, you know, who work at universities, and you make a point in your acknowledgments that one of your colleagues made it very clear that the military and universities are not alike, but we get subjected to all sorts of training videos, you know, by our human relations department telling us how to behave on this and that. And I don't know many people, at least in the academy, that wouldn't roll their eyes or think like, seriously, um, this is what HR departments do. But going back into the late 60s and 70s with these training programs, was there vigorous debate or pushback about technique, about content, uh, about what this sort of small group or large group educational programming, um, is it effective? Is it not effective? Um, one, one quick point. It, it wasn't a colleague of mine who said that. It was um, a veteran who had been a lurk in Vietnam. Um, and his it was a little bit less gentle than the way you imagined um, <laughs> it. <laughs> I was um, being careful. <laughs> you were. You were. Uh, so, yeah, there was pushback. Um, I mean, there was pushback in that the Defense Race Relations Institute just stopped doing it after a while. But a lot of the pushback came from Congress. I mean, some of the pushback came from people in the field who just like, I don't want to bother with this stuff. It's, you know, just another order that's coming down from on high. I don't need to waste our time with this. I'm not going to do it. Or for, from, you know, uh, enlisted men, black, white, and, and other races and ethnicities who just, you know, saw this as a waste of time. But Congress got very conservative members of Congress got very exercised about this. And um, it, it, much of it sounds like what we hear today in terms of the woke military. You could practically just, you know, put different people's names on the comments and you wouldn't work twice. Um, and that did have an impact on the change in the ways in which the Defense Race Relations Institute approached training. So, so yeah, there was a lot of pushback. And, and there probably should have been pushback because you know, that approach, that that insistence in, you know, bearing one's soul and coming face to face with one's own race, racism. And at that point, they assumed that black people were equally racist. Um, 
you know, it, it, it takes a lot more training than the people who were often trying to do this in the field had, and it, it could be a mess, and it often was. You do point out, and I think this is a very interesting, you know, point that that the Senate Armed Services Committee, on that committee, sat many extremely senior white segregationists. You know, men who had for years, in some cases decades, uh, filibustered civil rights legislation and then voted against that civil rights legislation, and then attempted to stymie the army's efforts, you know, at at reform. Um, but on the issue of the different service branches, uh, Alan Gross writes, were you able to distinguish the quality of race relations work by military service, that is Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps, as well as the Army, even though the book is about mm -hmm. the Army? Yeah. Um, and I mean, some people have said, well, why didn't you write about the other services? And I mean, part of my answer is because I'm trying to look at institutional culture and logic, and there's no way you know somebody's going to confuse the function of the Marine Corps and the function of the Army. Um, a lot of the documents that I found, especially coming from the Department of Defense, posed issues and then asked the, the heads of the different services to respond to them. And um, the responses were enlightening, if, if not um, striking, but often confirmed what you might think. Um, the Air Force tended to sort of shrug and say, yeah, we're already doing that. Um, the Army tended to offer long, complicated non-concourse um, and it, it sort of fell out across that that spectrum. Um, but the Defense Race Relations Institute was a defense Department of Defense initiative. And so people were being trained from all the different institutions, the, the different services there. So they were getting common training. Um, a lot of it really depended on, you know, local command and how how willing and interested the, the commanders were in addressing these issues, how much time they were willing to give it in, in their complicated schedules. Um, individuals did matter, um, but I, I haven't I haven't looked at a, a fully comparative set of implementation in terms of the different services, just at their responses to the commands to the directives that were coming from the Department of Defense. Thank you. Um, our time is running out. But I want to ask you just to perhaps wrap up with there's an anecdote at the toward the end of the book that I found just kind of somewhat stunning. Um, and so for all of the efforts uh, that the army has been undertaking uh, up to this point, Richard Nixon decides that West Point should build a monument to the soldiers uh, who fought for the lost cause, um, uh, West Pointers who lost their lives serving on the Southern side. Uh, and so this is 1971, it's before the election, uh, but after many of the efforts, or at the same time, many of the efforts that you're talking about have been taking place. Could you just tell us a little bit more about what happened there and how it resolved? Well, first, let me just start by saying Ty Schedule has done some really um, important work on this. And so, you know, part of what I've done is, is primary source research, but I'm also relying heavily on him. Um, yeah, Richard Nixon came up there. Uh, he was trying to consolidate uh, his political advantage in the South, and he thought a great way to do it would be to have this massive monument to those who had served um for the Confederacy. And when the commandant of, of West Point tried to manage it by saying, yeah, we'll do it in a museum exhibit, um, he wasn't having any of it. Um, it was also a non-funded mandate. Um, and West Point had started working really hard to increase the number of its Black uh, cadets. Uh, in After 166 years in 1968, there had been, I think, 60s, um, well, it was, a, it was only a handful. It was like 60 black cadets who had been graduated from West Point. Um, in the 1950s, counting all four classes, there were usually about 20. Uh, people had been silenced. Their, their, the white cadets would not even speak to them or, or make eye contact with them for the full four years other than when they had to directly. Um, and, and so they had worked hard to bring in a, a pretty a strong cohort of black cadets and and they heard about this and a, a really smart uh way of creating a situation in which it could not move forward in part by getting uh, a reporter from ebony magazine to write a profile the profile of them and making clear that they were going to be able to create massive protest uh 
uh, at West Point if this went forward. And um, in some ways, it's a, a testimony to the commandant who had faith in these cadets and was working to try and make sure this wasn't happening. But, you know, it's quite a testimony to a bunch of 18 to 22 year olds that they had that kind of savvy and that kind of will um, to to create a set of, of demands and to, to contact the media in a way that was not overt and direct, but was clearly going to uh, stop something that would have been just an egregious act in, in terms of uh, recognizing the, the contributions of African-Americans to this nation. Thanks. I unfortunately have to draw this to a close. It's 5.30, so my appreciation to Beth, to Gregory, to Christian, to those of you in the audience who posed questions. Uh, with that, I turn it back to Christian for final words. Sir. Thank you. Uh, great discussion. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Greg and Eric. Um, just a reminder, uh, next Monday, November 6th, we're uh, featuring a discussion of a new book, uh, The Struggle for Iran, Oil, Autocracy, and the Cold War, 1951-54. to Please join us for that. Otherwise, please stay safe and uh, good night. <laughs>